Hey, I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much, Benedict. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to be here tonight. Um, and I want to share some insights we gained over the last couple of years um, talking about how to sustainably innovate in healthcare. So thanks for the nice uh, invite. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Franz. Uh, I'm a medical doctor, as uh, you just mentioned, Benedict. And I'm also a data scientist and serve as the CEO of uh, DeepSea, which is um, our company in the field of health AI. And tonight I want to talk about some matters in our world that are or should be at least of interest to all of us. So some people might be ignorant about some important topics like the environment, for example, or uh, clean energy, or even the world food supply. Uh, but we all can agree for every single one of us, it would be really, really hard to say that we do not care about our health, especially in such times. And everyone has one or the other touch point with healthcare, having had a vaccination as a child or having undergone a surgery. So healthcare accompanies you during your whole lifespan until death, and everyone makes their own individual encounters one day or the other. <clears throat> but um, healthcare is not only of public and private interest and concern, but also, and sometimes people tend to forget that, Healthcare is also a crucial part of our economy. And of course, it's about cash as well. So, so healthcare is considered to be one of the strongest, if not the strongest industry of all, with around 10% spending of GDP worldwide. That's a lot. And at the same time, healthcare is considered to suffer from major obstacles. And I read recently an article that uh, summarized them quite nicely in four challenges. So they say, first of all, and as a consequence of what I just said, basically, our societies experience an ever-increasing cost burden caused by healthcare delivery. Um, second, um, and at the same time, uh, albeit uh, high resource input, medical errors are happening. So most of those could be easily prevented. The third challenge that they mention is um, around science, because science unlocks more and more knowledge about health and our bodies then um, this explosion of medical knowledge is really hard to digest for a doctor. So in fact, uh, the knowledge is doubling every 73 days. And a study suggests that a primary physician would need to spend 21 hours a day reading to keep pace. And last but not least, healthcare is slow. Trust me, it's very slow. It takes um, about three and a half years, just as an example, for regulatory bodies to withdraw drugs that are found to be unsafe. And another example, it takes eight and a half years for drugs to reach a stable level of prescription. So this essentially means that patients are routinely waiting to be prescribed drugs or undergo procedures and interventions that have actually been proven to be effective already decades ago. So that's the reason why many industry experts are desiring solutions desperately awaiting a digital disruption of healthcare, hoping that data-driven digital solutions and AI also uh, might contribute to solve those challenges. So similar to areas like travel or finance where we already witnessed the disruption and where it already happened. But the harsh truth is those experts are waiting and they keep on waiting and they spend more time waiting and if we look at the facts, we realize that healthcare is one of the most undigitized industries of all, hardly beating construction, agriculture, and hunting. And frankly, I need to be very creative to see ways <clears throat> how, to see, how to fully digitize hunting. So we can conclude that healthcare is a technological lagger. And so it's of highest interest for all of us, of course. I can see many innovators and great, great minds in bureaus here at CDTM having a bright future ahead. And for many, healthcare is very appealing, which I understand, um, as an industry to work in. And in job interviews, I almost always ask the question, why do you want to work with us? And each time I basically um, get similar answers and they all include one word, which is this one. So especially when you're a future founder already having an eye 
on the healthcare industry, there are a couple of things I want you to know to make well-informed decisions about your future. So um, that's the reason why tonight I want to talk about factors that we um, at DeepC and projects that I've been involved in have identified over the last couple of years that explain why disruption is not happening that easily in healthcare. And at the same time, I definitely do not want to scare you off. Um, that's why I'm also trying to highlight some approaches how to address those challenges. So in the following, I want to talk about the, how I call them seven paradoxes of healthcare innovation. And I'm sure there are many more, but uh, those have crossed my path over and over again. Um, and I therefore consider them as important. So let's start. Um, you may know this chart. Um, every startup goes through different stages and the paradoxes will be relevant in any stage of a healthcare startup. And right in the very beginning, we have um, an ideation phase. And essential recipe um, of success for startups are methods called design thinking or lean startup. And essentially those methods are aiming at a highly iterative process. And this first paradox I call design thinking paradox. Here you can, can see a design thinking process, it's based on iteration. <clears throat> so the learning process basically includes hypothesis verification, uh, falsification, testing, making mistakes and learning from those. <clears throat> basically doing that over and over again. And in healthcare, you should do it the same, I believe. But there is a problem because the stakes are much higher. The cost of failing, even initially, can be high and cause serious consequences. For example, in terms of data breaches or the safety of patients, which can even lead to death. <clears throat> so what people tend to do is developing products and then start testing after the three to five years development process. Usually they then find out that they have a solution, but were not able to address a relevant problem. Basically, they find themselves in a dilemma having ignored basic design thinking principles. Again, I believe um, in healthcare, you should establish iterative methods, but it can be really hard to design such a process. And to overcome the challenge, you need to find that kind of safety corridor and develop methods how you can get user feedback without risking the safety and security. So one way could be to closely work with experts. That's what we do um, in all of our projects. So the second one I want to talk about is um, the so-called ground truth paradox. It refers to AI and in order to train AI, which can provide value to humans, you need basically human input. But the problem is that this can pose a natural threshold on the performance of supervised AI systems because humans, of course, are not perfect. So therefore, I advise you to actively um, and deeply quality control the human input that you use uh, to overcome that challenge. And the, the third one is closely related uh, to the second one, which is the cold start problem or a cold start paradox. So um, the third one refers to the cold start problem in AI. And in order to create an AI initially, you need data. And um, at some point, to a certain degree, you always have that kind of paradox. But in healthcare, it's especially important to consider because when you stand at the very beginning, no one promised will actually give you data due to valid privacy concerns, for example. So uh, you can address that challenge by initially building alliances or coming up with proof of principles using publicly available data, which later on gives you the credibility to access more data. So the fourth one I call the sharp versus broad paradox. It's a really interesting one. Um, so when building a venture in general, not in healthcare, in the best case, you try to maximize your value proposition with highly limited resources. So getting the most out of it. So in healthcare, you often find yourself in a situation where you have a lot of dependencies. So this is quite normal. You have different interfaces, um, no standards of data or, or structures, uh, heterogeneous IT infrastructures, data privacy concerns and regulations, uh, and security uh, regulations, et cetera, et cetera. So this produces a lot of overhead initially if you really want to provide a holistic value to the entire workflow of a physician, for example. On the other hand, if you try to limit your death overhead, your value proposition might suffer. I summarized in that chart. So either high death cost um, and high value 
um, but probably you will not even get there, or low death cost, but also low value. So the target should be to basically identify that sweet spot, um, which allows you to enter the system with a very strong initial value proposition, which is sharp, um, and, um, but, but um, using minimum resources to reach that value proposition. And then later on, from that position, uh, you expand on your value proposition in a broad way, um, and uh, identifying such opportunities is really important. So the next paradox is referring to the antagonism between impactful solutions and the willingness uh, to pay for them. So we find that very often in the healthcare domain, and everyone is talking about the impact. Also, I did it in that talk. Um, so impact can mean quality of care, quality of life, quality of outcomes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the problem is, if you just focus on delivering the impact, nobody will be willing to pay for it. So therefore, you always need to keep in mind to balance both the impact part, which can be a quality gain, for example, and at the same time deliver, for example, cost savings or another attractive incentive, which may be an efficiency gain, for example. Um, so this is really important um, to, to think about that from the very beginning. And the sixth paradox is referring to the multi-stakeholder landscape that you find in healthcare. I call it the opposing interest, uh, interest paradox. So let's look at another industry for a second, the automotive industry. And in the automotive industry, you often find a situation of strong stakeholder alignment. So um, let's look at a simplified example. You build a cool car, um, buy parts from the manufacturer, assemble those, then uh, the seller um, delivers the car to the end customer, customer is happy. So there's a clear exchange of value, which is pointing all into the same direction, from left to right. And along this value chain, the target for all of those players is to maximize this value. And in healthcare, I sketched it out a little bit in the next slide, um, it can be a little bit more complex. So let's imagine you are a startup with a new cool healthcare product uh, in the digital space. And in this example, you as a startup, um, you um, sell your product to the hospital uh, who pays you, but actually you deliver it to the IT department. And then um, the IT department installs and maintains within the hospital. The hospital equips the doctor with um, the product who then delivers the value to the patient. And uh, the patient actually pays for it indirectly by contributing to the health insurance and the health insurance can uh, reimburse the hospital if they have a, a contract. So as you can see, it's a crowded space. There is a lot of uh, space for friction as well. And um, there are opposing interests. So for example, the doctor uh, wants great usability. The hospital needs a clear incentive to buy your product, for example, by reimbursement. And the patient wants to benefit since he or she contributes to the insurance. And the IT department, very important, uh, wants to keep the maintenance uh, overhead as low as possible. And the insurance, of course, does not necessarily want to pay for yet another product. So it's very crowded and very complicated. And you need to keep it in mind that your product must satisfy and have answers for all of those needs and stakeholders at the same time. So um, this needs to be thought through um, beforehand. And the last challenge that I want to present you is referring to funding of your health startup. It's the risk versus opportunity paradox. So we all agree, agree that there is great opportunity in the healthcare space, but also, as you just see, there are great risks. And um, for any other venture, we see usually would like to invest after an initial phase of de-risking um, and then maximize the return. In healthcare, however, the dynamics are slightly different. The initial phase is pretty long and it carries a high risk and it is capital intense. So usually a VC has their sweet spot later and where there is less risk basically. So keep that in mind and prepare for bootstrapping or alternative funding sources to bridge that gap. So I hope that this was insightful and showed you why disruption in healthcare is not that easy. Um, so in healthcare, I believe innovation happens much more in a step-by-step -step manner, which also has its advantages by the way. And instead of being a thunderstorm, be a river, but make just sure you maintain a high current. And a very smart guy once said he sees the biggest innovations at the intersection of biology and technology to happen. 
And I personally wish to witness some of you contributing to those biggest innovations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Franz. Uh, that was um, very interesting. Um, we already have um, one concrete question for you. Um, what are concrete product examples at Deep Sea uh, where you applied the principles that you have currently uh, that you showed previously? Uh, thank you very much for for that question. It's a very interesting one. So, um, for example, um, we um, applied that um, paradox of sharp versus broad um, by having a very uh, sharp um, focus in the beginning, um, but uh, that focus allowing us to expand our initial value proposition rapidly. And um, that's one of the principles we applied, but uh, there are also others, like, for example, the cold start problem or the ground truth uh, paradox. For example, regarding the ground truth paradox, uh, we have um, established certain measures to ensure that our data is very clean and uh, that the labels can be trusted. Um, and regarding cold start paradox, due to the methods that we develop, uh, we don't depend on um, tremendous amounts of data, which helps us to overcome that cold start problem. And uh, there are a couple of more, uh, but I can also uh, answer individually if there is any interest. Thank you. And um, do you think uh, product development cycles in healthcare need to be shortened um, to keep up with technological advancements? Um, in general, that would be very um, um, I, yeah, it would be very beneficial if that's possible. But the problem in healthcare is actually not the technology lifecycle itself. I see it more in the area of dependencies to other stakeholders. Um, so, for example, um, we ran our first clinical study um, at the University Hospital, and from the uh, moment we decided to run the study until we could actually start the study, one year passed. And this was not due to a technological problem, but due to dependencies. So you need to talk to data protection officer, present and discuss the con uh, concepts, it's a very iterative process. You need to talk to the IT department, uh, which is amazing at University uh, Hospital Rechtsisa. We are very grateful to work with uh, such great guys in, in just in general, like in all departments. Um, then you need to talk to the ethical committee, present your study concept. Um, then you, of course, need to work with the uh, clinicians and so on. There are many dependencies, legal department, not to forget, um, that you need to uh, fulfill and manage. And it just takes time. It's just like that. All right. And um, the next one we have, in healthcare, you encounter many established structures. Um, how do you deal with this and who are important partners in the Munich ecosystem to tackle this that you might leverage at the moment? Mm -hmm. So first of all, let me la answer the last question. So yeah. um, Munich, if you want to start a healthcare venture, Munich is a great place to be basically. There are other uh, hotspots in Germany like Erlangen with the Medical Valley, which is also great because it combines industry and uh, university, but also university hospital. But you find similar patterns in uh, in, in Munich. So we have actually two university hospitals um, due to two universities that are cutting edge at uh, machine learning and AI, computer vision, etc. Um, and we have a strong ecosystem with um, Unternehmertum, with um, CDTM uh, to be mentioned specifically uh, that um, foster that um, technological advances. So um, it's, a, it's a great spot, spot to be in Munich for such an uh, endeavor. Yeah. And oh, pardon? no problem. I think the first question was how to overcome those, um, um, those challenges or those static um, yeah, um, properties of, of the healthcare domain. And basically it's about um, communication and really understanding each stakeholder's interests. Only if you um, come to a state where you deeply understand uh, their interests and, and needs, you can basically build those alliances. And that's a very important first step. Once you master that, um, you can basically um, build alliances and uh, find partners who can help you along the way. Nice, thank you. Um, one other question that um, many people seem to be really curious about. So um, what exactly is DeepSea doing and, and what exactly is your product? Okay, so uh, happy to answer that. So DeepSea is building a diagnostics operating system for future healthcare institutions. 
that um, enables AI solutions to be adopted and integrated into the clinical workflow. So at the same time, we also build our own AI products which sit on that operating system, but we also will open it um, up for uh, many other um, um, players in that field um, to integrate into that operating system later on. And we are working together with um, uh, several clinical partners and distribution partners um, to uh, facilitate um, that vision. Um, thanks. And the next one from Merle. AI and ethics. How do you address misdiagnoses resulting from an AI-based approach? So uh, that's a very good question. And um, we think about it a lot, of course. Um, so the simple shortcut answer is that um, misdiagnosis can happen. It can happen um, caused by a human also, it can call, be caused by uh, an AI. Um, so that's totally, um, yeah, it's, it's in the range of um, possible outcomes. Um, the question is how you um, implement specific safety uh, fallbacks uh, to avoid uh, serious consequences. So um, one of um, our main questions that we ask ourselves is what is the status quo? What's the baseline? And um, the baseline is not 100% accuracy. Also humans make errors. So what we try to do is basically um, combine the strengths of humans and AI to surpass that, um, that performance threshold, um, which is the status quo, and get beyond. Um, and combine um, the strength of both, uh, both is basically the best what you can do at this point. Um, and um, having the human in the loop is also a very uh, relevant principle um, to um, guarantee higher safety. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Um, another one from a different uh, angle. Um, do you have quick tips on how to deal with the sensitive issue of data collection keeping a GDPR compliant? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so um, there are many tips <laughs> how, to, how to do that. Um, the uh, one that is um, yeah, above all um, is basically consent um, from the patient. So um, you um, can inform the patient about um, a study and about the purpose you need the data for and just ask for consent to use the data. So that's one of the major four um, ways how to um, deal or process healthcare data in a GDPR compliant way. Um, another one is you don't need any consent if you uh, use data for diagnostic purposes. Um, and there are other ways to, to process data, but that necessarily does not allow you to store and use the data for secondary purposes. So um, the yeah, uh, straightforward answer is getting consent. Another option would be to anonymize the data, fully anonymize the data, um, and then use it for secondary purposes. Usually such procedures uh, require the uh, consent from an ethical committee because um, the um, patient does not give their consent, obviously. And uh, out of transparency, I'm always a big fan of um, nevertheless uh, getting consent from the patient. Uh, not because you need it due to GDPR, but just to be transparent. And I think transparency can build trust. And people, once people understand that they have benefits um, from sharing their data in a pseudonymized or anonymized way, it can be beneficial for themselves, but also for all of our society. So it's a kind of mindset um, that needs to be adopted over time. But I see a good development here. 